from this point on, for the foreseeable future, I'm calling this time a time for miracles. We have uh, a shortage of miracles happening in here in Springfield. The uh, buckle on the Bible belt, of all places, we're in the shadows of the international headquarters of the Assemblies of God. We're in the shadows of the headquarters of the Baptist Bible Fellowship and Baptist Bible College where Jerry Falwell graduated. Of course, he was never much inclined for miracles. But um, the Assemblies of God certainly were in years past. Now it's very difficult to find a church that really deals with miracles. And as a result, we're not seeing the miracles that we ought to see. God has not changed. Jesus, according to the book of Hebrews, Hebrews was the same yesterday, today, and forever. So uh, it's, it's not God's fault that we're not seeing miracles. It's got to be somebody else's fault. It's not God's. So anyway, we're going to try to break through that log jam. We've had wonderful miracles happen here in uh, this space in years past. Uh, we had broken bones healed on the spot. We had uh, the problem heel pain that, that uh, Nick Nickell had. Uh, that's very, very excruciating. By the time we prayed for him, he walked down onto the main floor. He was healed. And uh, we've had uh, a sheriff, a former sheriff from Iowa that had his broken foot healed here, as well as leukemia went into regression uh, and a uh, number of things. And the heart palpitations were healed. We've had um, people delivered in this place. So we need to get back to it. The long and the short of it, we need to get back to that. It's not God's fault that it's not been happening. If it's not happening here, uh, the, the blame lays at our doorstep. I will tell you that uh, Nancy and I were very encouraged just a few days ago because we went to the zoo for an open house that was sponsored by a financial planner and his uh, his office and we were there as guests and uh, as soon as we arrived and parked the car and got out his wife came up to us and hugged us and and wanted to give us a victory report and frankly uh, i had forgotten but a year and a half ago when they were having their open house at their new office as we passed by her office, she got us and led us into a closet because there were a lot of people around. She wanted privacy. Her mother was suffering from pancreatic cancer. And we prayed for her mother in a closet in their new office building. And I forgot all about it. And she told us uh, we could go Saturday at the zoo. Her mother is healed of pancreatic cancer. That, that just doesn't happen. That's a miracle. Uh, Dr. Wilkie, a medical doctor here, he knows people do not, don't survive pancreatic cancer unless God intervenes. So we know that it's still possible, but isn't it interesting that Nancy and I would pray and forget that we'd prayed for her. I hope there's some people you've forgotten that you prayed for and that you'll get a, get a good response, a good report, and uh, then you'll be reminded that God is still on the throne and prayer changes things, just like old Brother Weber used to say in the South West Radio Church of the Air every morning, Monday through Friday for years and years and years. He'd bring on this program. God is still on the throne and prayer changes things. Last weekend, uh, Nancy and I were privileged to have the honor to go back to my hometown, Moberly, Missouri, about 200 miles north of, uh, of Springfield, north and a little east. And uh, we spent uh, Sunday afternoon with the family of a classmate of mine who had passed away. And uh, uh, God has shown me some lessons there. Uh, two people that I knew in high school uh, married. Just two people, man and woman. And then they had two children, a man and a woman. And then those children had three children each, and each of those three children have children. And I realized God multiplies exponentially. The blessing multiplied exponentially. The lady that I met 70 years ago in junior high school and her husband, two people, they had a lot of folks for the visitation. 
and a lot of folks at the graveside and a lot of folks at the funeral. I had the privilege of preaching the funeral then on Monday morning at 10 o'clock and presiding at the grave as well. And uh, through it all, we were blessed abundantly. It was a time of great victory, great victory. So to repeat, God is still on the throne and prayer changes things. I want to uh, pray for us first and then... Uh, uh, read some scripture. Then as a part of our worship experience this morning or this afternoon, um, I'm going to repeat for you the Apostles' Creed. Please understand this is something that we all need to remember uh, when it says Holy Catholic Church is with a lowercase c. It doesn't mean Roman Catholic Church. It means the universal church. The word Catholic means universal. The Apostles' Creed goes like this. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. That statement says it all as to what we believe. Praise God. In the Gospel of according to St. John, chapter 5, give heed to these words. It says, beginning in verse 1, After this there was a festival of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate there is a pool called in Hebrew Bethsaida, which has five porticos. In these lay many invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man was there who had been ill for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had been there a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be made well? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. And while I'm making my way, someone else steps down ahead of me. Jesus said to him, Stand up, take your mat, and walk. At once the man was made well, and he took up his mat and began to walk. Now that day was a Sabbath. So the Jews said to the man who had been cured, It is the Sabbath. It is not lawful for you to carry your mat. But he answered them, The man who made me well said to me, Take up your mat and walk. They asked him, Who is the man who said to you, Take it up and walk? Now the man who had been healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had disappeared in the crowd that was there. Later Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you have been made well. Do not sin any more, so that nothing worse happens to you. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. Therefore the Jews started persecuting Jesus because he was doing such things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, My father is still working, and I also am working. For this reason the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because he was not only breaking the Sabbath, but was also calling God his own father, thereby making himself equal to God. So ends the reading of God's wonderful and holy word. I will say this about this passage of scripture. First of all, it's interesting that this man had been ill for 38 years and nothing apparently could have been done or was done for him until Jesus saw him. We have some folks that have been ill a long time, had various infirmities, problems, whether it's sickness or addiction or problems in a family, all kinds of things. And no one's been able to do anything or no one has done anything. But when they meet Jesus, even if they don't know it's Jesus, his power isn't limited. And then the second thing, the man's excuse was, I don't get any help with this. Jesus didn't accept the excuse. Uh, if we want to be healed, if we want to see miracles, I think the time for excuses is over. It's just over. Jesus then commanded him, stand up, take your mat, and walk. 
I didn't see Jesus. So I didn't hear anything about it or read anything about Jesus trying to say something extremely nice to the guy or very comforting. He wasn't making over him. He simply gave him a command, a very gentle command. But he said, stand up, take up your mat and walk. Now, there must have been something in the authority of those words because that's exactly what the man did. He stood up, picked up his mat, and then he began to walk. There were three steps there. Stood up, took up his mat, and walked. But there was another step before that that we overlook, and that is that he really was obedient to the word that he received. So there's four steps, really. Now then, that day was the Sabbath. And uh, it shows us that Jesus can heal any day he wants to. Any day. He can heal you the second Tuesday of next week. <laughs> he may have healed you the third Thursday of last week and you just didn't respond. So Jesus is always on the job. Amen. He's no respecter of the clock. He's no respecter of the day. He doesn't respect the calendar. After all, he divided the calendar from B.C. to A.D. He has command of the calendar, command of every day of the week, command of every moment of every day. So he can do what he wants to do when he wants to do it Amen. without hindrance. He can do it wherever he wants to do it. The healing of this man did not take place in a synagogue. It didn't take place in the temple. It took place by a pool of water that uh, probably superstitiously people waited for the water to stir mysteriously and then get in hoping, hoping to be healed. Jesus is not limited, limited by the place. He will heal you wherever he wants to heal you. <coughs> Jesus then, last of all, I say about this, Jesus said, my father is working and I'm working too. That has not changed. It hasn't changed. Now, in case you just think that this is the only kind of miracle that God can do, think about all the other kinds of miracles that Jesus performed. Healing the blind. Of course, here was a lame man, perhaps, another lame man that was let down through the roof of a house, and, and the lepers being cleansed. The list went on and on. Even those that had the palsy were healed. Everything that was wrong could be made right by Jesus. But you see, it was happening before Jesus, and Jesus knew it because he was with the Father from the beginning. If you read in 2 Kings very extensively, you'll discover that, that God worked miracles for people in other sets of circumstances. There was a woman who'd been rich. But when her husband died, she found out she was poor, and the creditors came calling. You know, the, a lot of this money that people have is strictly on paper. And when the paper is gone, their assets are gone. And uh, they were going to take her sons and uh, enslave them to pay the debt. But the old prophet came along and said, send your boys out to collect every jar they can get and start pouring, pouring your oil into those jars. Filled them all up and had oil left over. He took care of a financial need. So God can handle physical things. He can handle financial things. God can handle mental things. There was the, the Jesus took care of the lunatic that came out of the out of the cemetery <laughs> naked because he kept ripping his clothes off, and he was so out of his mind and had so much strength he would tear the chains apart. They couldn't bind him and hold him. And Jesus delivered that man from a very serious mental illness. The list goes on and on and on. What about relationships? Well, that is a very small order for God. In every family, there are some broken pieces. In every family. Your family and my family. And don't think there isn't, because I know better and you know better. Not everyone gets along just because they share the same bloodline. There are those that may be a little picky about things. There are those that can be uh, contrary. There are those that uh, at the drop of a hat, they stop speaking. And the list goes on and on and on. In every family, there are problems. God is a miracle worker. He can put families together. 
He can put families back together. Amen. God is the head of the family, and he's not pleased when his children are bickering. Therefore, as head of the family, God will take care of it. We just have to own up and say, Father, I need some help with this. Now, th this little message here... Uh, isn't all that profound theologically, but I will tell you this much before I close it. I think sometimes we don't realize how reluctant we are to have a miracle because we've learned to live with a situation and we become accustomed to our circumstances. And therefore, we may be closing out a chance for God to do something that would win many people to Christ. I really believe that that's one of the problems about the absence of miracles, because we are a failure to admit that we need one. Secondly, I think we have a problem with miracles, because even though we are prayed for, we really inside, deep down somewhere, we refuse to cooperate. And then third, I think sometimes we don't get a miracle because God knows in his all-knowing, because he's all-knowing, that whatever we did to cause this problem, you're going to do it again. Now, I have a need for miracles right now. My grandson, one, one of my grandsons, who's about 36 and a half years old, has um, a bone disease. I talked with Dr. Wilkie about it. Uh, neurovascular something or other. Anyway, it's in his hip, and it's a case where blood is not flowing into the hip. He's on a walker. He had to give up his job, temporarily at least, at uh, Hobby Lobby, where he'd worked for many years because they, they wouldn't let him work for danger of falling and so forth. And so he's on a uh, medical leave right now. But when that's over, uh, his paycheck stops. And uh, he has a, a tremendous hip problem, a young man on a walker with a disease in his bones. Now, uh, he also has extreme financial needs, very extreme. He's about to lose his house. Uh, and so uh, he's pretty much by himself because he's been estranged from our family uh, of his own accord. Nobody cut him off. He cut himself off for reasons that I won't go into that are a little conflict that he had with one member of the family. Therefore, he felt like uh, then none of the family could, uh, could relate to him. But finally, he sent me a text yesterday telling me the predicament that he's in. His mother is over in Illinois. And uh, I saw this morning on Facebook, she had a message. And I thought, well, maybe it's about PJ. His name is Paul Joseph, and we call him PJ. It wasn't. It was to warn me that somebody may have, uh, somebody was tapping into messenger accounts and sending false messages and so forth. Well, I know that goes on all the time. I responded in the message by letting her know what was going on with her son. I got a very terse message back, almost if, as if to say, uh, keep your nose out, shut up. I know what my children are doing. I stay in touch with my children. I thought, oh, well, I won't respond to that, you know. So this goes on. That's a prayer need. I think it would be wonderful if we would see that miracle. You see, many years ago, when I was pastor of a little church out in the country, um, right in the middle of my message, the Holy Spirit stopped me. And he said, the day will come, and I announced it to the people. I said, the day will come when Paul Jr. and Paul Joseph will share an evangelistic platform with you. I still believe that. God doesn't change his mind. Now, he's going to have to do something with Paul Joseph. He's going to have to do something with Paul Jr. to get them both together at the same time and share an evangelistic platform with me. But God can do all these things. You see, I don't walk around all the time leveraging family problems or illnesses and all that sort of thing because I don't have to. I have peace. I have the peace that passes all understanding. I know in whom I have believed, and I will not do other than stand. I know what I heard, and I stand on it. Now, I'm 83 years old. Some people may say, well, it might have been nice if God had done this 20 years ago or more. Well, I don't know. God is also the, perfect with his timing. He knows when it's, he's going to do something for us that's for our good, that we will not allow it to become harmful. Do you understand that? It's, it's God's timing. Now, uh, I also have a need for a personal miracle. 
Uh, I've had my face cut on here this past week because there's a little precancerous thing and I got the word back that it was and the dermatologist is sending me to a surgeon uh, because they want to cut a bigger slice uh, and uh, so it's minor surgery obviously in and out but I don't want cancer any more than you want it so if I can head it off of the past and use the some miracle that God gives the talent to medical doctors I mean all knowledge belongs to God and some people because they have a mind that can handle it they can tap into that knowledge and they can use it to me that's still a miracle Oral Roberts got it right when he put the hands together and one was the hand of prayer and the other the hand of medicine prayer and medicine Dr. Wilkie here a medical doctor he's got a good brain he could he learned all that stuff in medical school he's gifted for that he's a walking miracle you all know, need to think about that. He's a walking miracle. Dennis Code back there was this tremendous anointing on him. I've seen him t hold somebody's hand and, and just call for the Holy Spirit and that person fall down under the power of God. That's a miracle. So we, we're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. We have miracles right here in our midst. Now, uh, I also have this bad right knee and it's been bad for a long time. Uh, Steve Schultz, he had two bad knees. He used the miracle of modern medicine to have his one knee replaced. Uh, he's getting ready to have the other one replaced. I'm not into that game. I want a different kind of miracle. Uh, I think I'm too old to have that kind of miracle. Randy Barr had both knees replaced. That's a miracle. It's a miracle that Randy's here because he struggled with the bipolar situation for years. But he's here and he talks and he walks and he can sing and he can write poetry does all these things. It's a miracle. Well, I go in on the 16th for them to put four needles in my right knee so that they will burn nerve endings to get rid of the pain. Uh, that'll lay me up for a few days with ice packs on that knee and then I'll have to treat it with caution and then uh, after that in order to since I won't feel the pain in order to keep from wearing those bones out that are rubbing together I'll have to wear a knee brace when I'm going to do very much walking to keep that opened up that's a miracle that somebody could figure out that stuff I had a student when I was teaching at the college here his career goal was to make these artificial limbs that was what that's why he was in college so that he could go on and do that kind of training as far as I'm concerned I had a miracle there in my college class a young man with the desire in his heart and the ability in his brain to make use of the science that God made available that he could make artificial limbs for people that's a miracle so let's close the book on the idea that God is not in the miracle business he is and I'm believing that we're going to start seeing miracles miracles here like we used to see and they're going to be even bigger more miracles because the world is more challenging if there was ever a time when this nation needed to have a revival of miracles and the world a revival of miracles it is now but especially in America right now a great show of miracles will close the mouths of many critics 